a supernatural touch on them as they have headaches, Lord, or uh, maybe just had babies, whatever the situation is, Lord God, that you will just lay your hand on them, Lord God, that you will comfort and you will touch. And this morning we are expectant, expectant about whatever it is that you have for us. Lord, we say, have your way. You are welcome. Be glorified, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to 
leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord to me, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms.
Just take a second this morning just to breathe. Think about what God is doing. See what he might be speaking to you this morning. Thank him for his goodness. Praise him for the ability to have faith and trust him. Pray that he just increases your faith, increases your trust, increases your ability to lean in, to trust him, to have his way in your life. Unfolds, he's never failing. He's never failing. Sing, praise my soul, find strength. Enjoy that his words lead to all. Do not forget his great faithfulness. 
us all he's begun so take courage my heart stay steadfast my soul he's in the way failing he's never failing and you who hold the stars who call them each by name will surely God wants someone to know this morning that he never changes. Your perspective of him might change, but he is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful. He is good. He is loving. And he will never change from that. He will never stop loving you. He will never stop pursuing you. He will never stop wanting you. He will never stop providing for you, even when circumstances look bleak. God tells us in Isaiah 40 that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The things of this life are so temporary. And if we fix our eyes on Jesus, if we look to him, All the things that weigh us down slowly just start to slip away as we start to see them in perspective. It doesn't mean that they're not real needs, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't see them, that he doesn't care for you. But sometimes he allows the trials in our life to teach us something, to teach us how to love him more, how we need to change, how we need to grow. So this morning, God, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you don't change. God, we thank you that we can fully rely on you no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're walking through or facing. God, I thank you that you are good. God, we choose to bring to you all the things that are weighing us down this morning. Lord, all those things that throughout this week have just worn us out, worried us, made us cry. Lord, even the things that have given us joy and brought us hope and peace. Father, we lay it all at your feet and we know you are the giver of all good gifts. 
and you are the one who brings us through trials. As it says in James, we count it all joy when we are faced with trials of various kinds because we know you are producing something good within us. Lord, we choose to bear your name. We choose to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, no matter what we go through, So, Father, this morning I pray for every situation that's represented here, everyone who is facing some kind of difficulty or joy or struggle or just a new chapter in life, Father. God, we pray for those who are beginning their school year. Lord, whichever grade or level of education they're entering, I just pray that you would be with them that you would help them not to be overwhelmed by their class load, by the work that they have before them, that you would help them to do everything diligently and excellently as unto you and not to man. Lord, that they would learn, no matter what their grade says, that they would learn what they need to learn. Father, we just pray for them to be a light in their classrooms, wherever they are, to their classmates and to their teachers, Father. Lord, I just pray that you would give them divine words to speak, to encourage those around them. Lord, I pray for those who are at work, going to work day to day, that you would just help them in their jobs to be faithful, no matter what their bosses are like, no matter what their coworkers are like, that they would be a light and a joy for you. God, that they would bring that wherever they go that they would be influencers for change in a positive way for just to bring a difference to the atmosphere of the place that they go to. Father, I pray for those who are looking for work, that you would just help them to find that place that you have for them. Lord, I thank you that you are a provider, and I pray no matter what the bank account looks like, what bills are coming due, that we would all look to you to be our provider. Father, I even pray for this church that you would just provide, Father. Thank you for this building. Thank you for this land. And I just ask that you would continue to provide what is needed. Lord, I just pray for the people of this building, the people in this building, that you would be with each and every one of them. God, that they would just feel your peace and your presence with them. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all the members of Bethel. And Lord, we lift up to you those who are traveling right now, that you would just be with them, that you would protect them, and that they would just have a good time in their travels. And Lord, we pray for those who aren't here for other various reasons, that you would just be with them, that your healing touch would be with them. Lord, we pray for Taylor and for baby Tyler, who was born so early, Father. We thank you that he's breathing on his own. We thank you that the prognosis looks good, God. And we just pray that you would continue to have your hand in that family's life, that you would be with them, that you would bless them, Father. God, we pray for Jennifer as she's still recovering, that you would just be with her, that you would heal her, that you would relieve her pain. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We love you so much, God. We choose to worship you. We choose to praise you. We choose to turn our hearts to you this morning. Just prepare your hearts this morning, church. Prepare your hearts to hear the word. Prepare your hearts for Jesus to speak to you. He stands at the door and knocks. If anyone will hear his voice, and open the door, he will come in and be with you. So just open your heart to him this morning. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. You can all be seated, and I'm going to invite Kevin Wood to come on up. He's going to bring the word this morning. Um, The kids, uh, 12 years old and younger, will be going to Kids Church with me, so y'all can meet me at this door right after I pass off this mic. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, worship team. All right, so doing this without the headset like pastor uses is going to be a little bit different. I'm talking with my hands, so hopefully I keep this mic close enough to my mouth where y'all can understand me. <laughs> it's good to see everybody here in the house of the Lord this morning. I just want to start off by thanking Pastor and Sean and just for giving me this honor and this privilege to stand before you this morning. Um, you don't realize how difficult 
this job is and how it weighs upon you and the weight of it until you're standing up here. So I would just like to say I'm so appreciative of Pastor and everything he does, preparing a message for this church week after week. You know, I couldn't be more thankful. So this morning, let's open up to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. If you're there, say amen. If you're not, say hold up. All right. All right, we're going to be going to verse 8 and 9 to start off with. 8 and 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So look at your neighbor and say, the Lord is not slow. He is being patient for your sake. Dear Lord, I thank you for this word that you've given me. Your word is already blessed. I just ask that you enable me to just be a vessel to pass it along, Lord God. Open the hearts of the people that are here before us, the people watching online, Lord, that their hearts would be open and ready to receive the word you have for them today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So that verse right there has been one that's always confused me because I'm a numbers guy. And so when I hear something like Peter coming up with saying a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years, I'm like, whoa, Peter. Obviously, you are a fisherman and not a mathematician. That doesn't add up, you know. Um, and I've always tried to add, you know, look at it and try and make sense of it. Like, does that mean the earth was created in 6,000 years or is it really six days? But no, um, in order to really understand it, you got to go through the context of what that chapter is saying. So um, don't worry. We're going to read a little scripture this morning. I only got about three hours prepared. So hopefully y'all brought a lunch and y'all are ready to go. Okay. So we're going to just start off and read what Peter is writing to and what he's writing about. So let's start Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember the holy prophets, what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command and brought forth the earth from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you not, must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. I don't know if you've been outside lately. It almost seems like we're going through that now with this heat wave, like it's already being destroyed. <laughs> but since every, verse 11, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found, living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, speaking of these things in all his letters. Some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. 
then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. So thank you all for bearing with me. I know it's a long little scripture deal, but I just want to cover the whole letter and just use your imagination. That's what I had to do. I had to sit here and like going, okay, who's Peter talking to? He's talking to the people, what they, um, in Asia Minor, which is a Gentile territory that he had gone and planted churches in. And at this time, it's believed that Peter's sitting in a Roman jail, knowing that his death is imminent. And he's just trying to get out some last letters of encouragement. And he covers a lot of judgment in here. And he's t- talking about just the end of times. He says there will be mockers. To me, it's almost like the church is struggling. They're struggling because they've heard the good news. They've accepted the good news. But they're trying to share it to this Gentile and pagan nation. And they're talking about the second coming of Christ. And people are, years have gone by. People are making fun of them. You know, haters are going to hate. It's kind of like this world today. You're going to have people that are just going to mock your faith because you're believing for something to happen, and it hasn't happened yet. So he's trying to encourage them, push on. Don't mind the scoffers. Let them scoff. Don't judge them either. Just stay strong in your faith. You have a purpose here. It's interesting that after he tells them about the scoffers, he goes into the whole deal about the thousand days. What I found interesting is he says that God is being patient for your sake. See, when I first read this passage, I'm thinking, okay, he's being patient for all the sinners, those who have not been converted. But Paul's writing to a body of believers. He says, I'm being patient for your sake. For your sake, that no one should perish. So if you're a believer and you're trying to press on in the faith, why is God being patient on you? Why would you be destroyed if you are a believer? Well, when your faith gets diminished by the circumstances and the trials and the tribulations you're facing from the people around you, you can start to grow hard, hardened of heart. And it's no longer a priority sometimes to be a, to go out and preach to others, to share the gospel, to have a testimony and go share it. You just, that fire inside you can start to die. And see, God, Jesus says, I look at your heart, not your works, not what you say. I look at the intent of your heart. So he's trying to urge the believers, get rid of the hardness of heart. Instead of just standing by and watching this crowd of people and go, you know what? They're evil and God's going to just, he's going to bring judgment. I'm just going to stand here and I'm going to be still in my own salvation and be content with that. No. Then you're, you're taking the responsibility of God on your own shoulders and you're passing judgment on those around you. See, as he goes forward, yes, he does start warning about the judgment. Even to the believers, he tells them it's going to be consumed in fire. But is that a, a warning? Or is it also a way to try and intrigue the person to remember that every single body is a child of God? He loves them all. He vividly explains what's going to happen as the elements of the earth are burned away. Think about someone you love and picture them in a burning building. How eager would you be to try and get in there to save them before they burned up? That was your child, your brother, your sister. Well, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So, yes, we must know what's going to happen in the destruction of this world. But that should ignite a passion within us to go and reach the loss. Shauna has said this so many times. Look at the empty seats around you. We live in greater Baton Rouge with a population, two, three hundred, almost 400,000. I'm not sure the exact number. But we should have this place full. And it's not the responsibility of Pastor or Shauna. You know, he's, his responsibility is to lead us. As a church and as a community, we have to go out. We have to preach. We have to share the gospel. You know? 
We can't just sit by and just sit on our hands and wait. I'm reminded of the story of the talents. We were talking about it in Sunday school a couple weeks ago where the talents were issued out to the various servants. One of them just went and buried them in the ground. Two other ones multiplied theirs. The master came back, and they all had to take account for what they did. That's talking about money, maybe. But let's look at it figuratively. I mean, God gives you salvation and spiritual gifts. Are you just going to sit on them because you don't want to go out in the world and be judged, rejected? So you just hold on to your salvation and you sit at home. You're like, I'm good right here. I'm good right here. No, you're supposed to go out and multiply them. You're supposed to go out and multiply them. It says in, let's see, give me a second, I've got to refind it. Verse 13 says, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. Kind of reminds me of the story of Paul. He said he's looking forward as far as he's in a race. And he's looking at what's ahead, not what's behind. We have to keep track of what we're in this for. The race that God set before us. The commandment he gave us to love one another. To go out and preach to one another. To spread the good news. Verse 14 goes on to say, and so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives, pure and blameless. You know, my mom kind of wanted me to, she was saying when she found out that I was going to be preaching, she's like, I would love if somebody did an end of times. We don't talk about the end of times, and I'm not smart enough to start going through revelations with y'all. <laughs> you know, but... I do know that in this, it says we're delivered by the blood of the word, blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. But while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort. What are you doing while you're waiting? While you're waiting for the second coming of Christ, what are you doing? while you're waiting. We're all in this period of waiting in one form of another, whether it's on the return of Christ. You're waiting on a certain miracle to happen in your life, a certain job, a certain family member to come back to the Lord. We're all waiting for something. And yes, the Bible so many times has scriptures that say, wait upon the Lord. My question to you that I'm charging you with is, what are you doing while you're waiting? Because just because we're waiting doesn't mean that we sit still. Psalms 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. You know, while we're waiting for his return, we have to be strong to go out there and try and talk to somebody and face rejection, to spread our faith. It's going to take courage of the heart. I love the sermon series that Pastor was doing as far as don't take the bait because when it comes to going out and sharing the gospel you're going to run across a fence so much either by being rejected by somebody trying to argue their point with you somebody thinking you're crazy because they don't understand because sometimes even whenever you're modeling your faith maybe you're not sharing it vocally but a big part is not just talking the talk but walking the walk but as you're modeling your faith, you'll have people come against you because they see you maybe standing strong in your faith and not being deterred by the things of this world whenever trials come your way, and they get jealous. And so they come against you just to try and strike you down, just see if, they, if you can be shaken because you may think it's an attack against you, but they just want to see, is your faith strong enough? Is it grounded? Is it anchored in something that is strong enough to withstand the storms and the winds that you're going to ex experience in life. So we must stand strong. Stay, get courage. 
Know where your faith is. In the beginning of the letter, Peter reminded the church, number one, of remember what the holy prophets said. The prophets, yes, they did talk about judgment coming. They warned the country of Israel many times. Stop from your ways. Stop worshiping the idols. Return back to the Lord. But they also were pointing out the prophecies of the coming Savior. And I do believe, at least when I read it, that's my perception. That's what Peter was trying to do. He's like, I know it seems chaotic out in the world right now, but I want you to think about the Savior. Think about who the prophets spoke about, who they were talking that was going to come. Why? Because he's going to bring you peace. He's going to be your reason. And then he says, remember what the Lord, our God and Savior, commanded you through the apostles. Well, what did he command? Matthew 28, 19, 20 says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, back baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And I am with you always, even to the end of the world. When's the last time you made it a point to maybe see a coworker that's going through something, a family member, and not necessarily shoving the gospel down their throat, but just to be there for them. Say, hey, I'm here for you if you need to talk. And just loving them. Because what else did Jesus tell us to do? Love our God. Love our neighbors. Our neighbors is anybody you come into contact with. It also he commands us to forgive. How many times? 70 times 7. That's in a day. How many times are you going to be offended? You can either take the offense and be mad and hold on to it, and it's just going to drive a wedge between you and others around you, and they're going to see that behavior, and they're definitely not going to want any part of what you believe in. How are you going to convince them that your faith is real if you're shaking and holding grudges? I think that's one of the biggest things that keeps us from witnessing to others. In our life, we have circumstances that we face. And there's going to be troubles. You're not going to live a life. I don't care how you live your life, who your faith is in, you're always going to have troubles. You know, I'm glad I serve a living God that can come in and give me peace in the middle of the storm. It doesn't mean that my surroundings are going to all of a sudden be better, but I can sit and rest in that, knowing that I'm going to get through to the other side, and he's going to be with me every step of the way. And it doesn't mean that I'm strong all the time and that I don't start getting scared. No. <laughs> No, and that's when I bring it to God, and if I can't hear something directly from God, that's when I start calling those that I know are closest to me that I can go to and just pour out and say, what do I do? Can you have some words of encouragement? Because I'm not hearing it. I'm not hearing it. But sometimes the troubles that we go through in life, they can really make you struggle with your faith. You start hearing the circumstances of a doctor's report or a bad relationship. That's not going the way you want it to go. The waiting on the salvation of that loved one. And you've been praying for them, praying for them. It seems like the more you pray, the further they run. And so you just start saying, ah, what are you doing? We get in circumstances like that sometimes of people around us that know we're people of faith. And maybe they're still observing to see what your faith is going to do. They start mocking your faith. Where's your God now? Maybe you ought to just give up. You know, just go ahead and shut that person out of your life. And yeah, it's good to have boundaries. But sometimes we got to be careful about who we're letting speak into our life. You know, if you're going through a hard time and you're being depressed, get off of social media <laughs> and get on your knees. If you have social media, you're comparing your worst situation to their best situation. And when you feel like you're lacking in something and that you're not whole, it's hard to go out there with the confidence of your testimony and tell others about God because you feel like God's not involved in your situation. That's why you got to bring your situation to God. I know a lot of times why I don't go out and witness as much as I'm bringing this topic to y'all as far as a call to go out and share the gospel because I'm outreach leader and I haven't been doing outreaches. 
not even personally. And that's been heavy on my heart, and I'm, I feel like that's why I had to bring this message, a call to go out there and gather the people that are in the highways and the byways because they need to be here or in church. They need to know God. It doesn't matter what church they go to, but we have to share. But I'm honestly afraid of rejection because then I go back and wonder, did I say it right? Like, just like, I'm going to finish this sermon. I'm going to be home in a little while going, did I deliver it right? Because it is a heavy responsibility to sit there and say the right things. But you got to trust that God will give you the right words. You got to work. And you may not get it right. And that's okay. You learn from it. But you plant a seed. And then the next one waters. And the next one harvests. But I promise you, there's already been so many people that have been seeded, watered. Like Jesus said, the crop is ready and ripe for harvest. But the laborers are few. Where are the laborers? Naturally, whenever you get rejected for what you're saying, it causes offense. It does, because it stings a little bit. That's our pride, because we want people to approve of what we're saying. We don't feel like getting pushed away. <laughs> I love that throughout the Bible, Jesus gives us examples of different situations and pastors like I say he's been preaching on don't take the bait I'd like to cover a story of a woman that Jesus encountered that if she would have took the bait she would have never got what she was asking for turn with me to Matthew 15 21 through 28 Matthew 15 21 through 28 said, then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him, pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon and torments her severe, severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then the disciples urged him to send her away. Number one, if you're, you ever gone in prayer to God and you feel like he's not talking to you? That you're so desperate, and you're crying out to him, and it's like you're not hearing anything. And you start hearing the voices in the back of your head of people, God's not real. He don't talk to you. When's the last time you heard an audible voice? God's dead. He's a figment of imagination made by man so they can pour in to something that they feel is greater than them. But really, this world was created by a big bang. Like we're all just accidents. There is no God. You'll hear those voices. It's what society has twisted to go on and say. But I've been there. You're in a desperate situation. You're crying out to God and there's no answer. What do you do? Part of your heart, naturally, if you're not careful, will start to get hardened. Like, God, where are you? Where are you? But she keeps on pleading. She keeps on pleading. She's, and then the disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She's bothering us with all the begging. Now, I imagine that was Peter speaking up. He's always the outspoken one, you know. But, you know, that's an example of the church. God forbid we have somebody come in here broken, come in here that might be under the influence of drugs, not living the right life. Their lifestyle doesn't match up with our standards and our tenets of faith. And so we just look at them like, hey, <laughs> you know, you got to dress a certain way to be here. You know, those clothes reveal a little bit too much. Hey, why don't you come back whenever you sober up? Have we forgotten that the church is a hospital for the sick? It doesn't matter what they look like. Welcome them. Because it's not our place to judge and push them away. we got to welcome them here and say, look, there's a place at the altar. I'll pray with you. Just come on. There is a God. He is real. And you may not feel him speaking to you right now. But I promise you, we'll crowd around you and we'll pray for you if that's what you want. You know, I've been in a place where I was broken when I was younger. And I came to a member in the church. I got told they were too busy for me. It happens, people. People in church aren't perfect. And it did drive me away from God. So we got to be careful as an institution how we treat others around us whenever they come in. Because, believe me, people are looking to be critical. 
They're so skeptical. I mean, you've heard of the word church hurt, right? Where people have this little stigma where they get hurt by the church and they just run from it. For one reason or another, something happened and got said. They were treated a certain way. And so then the whole body of the church fell under this that I'm not going to go to church because of what this person did to me. It's kind of a silly stigma, right? That the whole church body will be judged for that. But that's how much responsibility is on it. That's how much the world is against the church. They'll cancel out the church in this cancel culture in a heartbeat for one wrong thing said, one wrong judgment. You don't see people saying, I'm not going to wear red no more because I was in Target and that employee was mean to me. So boycott red, that triggers me and I no longer, you know, I can't take it no more. No, but they will with church. So we have to be careful how we treat one another. It goes on to say, verse, I'll find my spot again, sorry. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was, only, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. <whistles> now, how many of you right there would have been like, okay, cancel Jesus right there? Because when I read that, I'm like going, hold on. I had to read it over and over several times the first time I read that the story. Because how could my Lord Jesus straight up call this woman a dog? She's in there pleading for help, and he just, I can't throw food to the dogs. It's not right. Man, I don't know about y'all, but I wouldn't have had the heart to stay there. You know, I'd have wanted to get up and walk away. <laughs> but this woman stayed. I think something perked up. I had to do a study, and this is why it's good to break down. I'm so glad that whenever I was in the program I was in, they taught us how to break down the Bible and look it up to see what the words mean in Greek. Because I think the, the woman's ears got attuned to what Jesus was saying. He said, we don't throw the food to the dogs. See, there's several different types of dogs that they talk about in the Bible. And see, this woman was a Gentile, not an Israelite. Well, the type of dog, they have wild dogs, and they have this dog. I'm not going to try and pronounce the word in Greek. I'm not that scholar. But this word dogs is not a wild dog. It's a family pet. And although that might seem offensive to some, <laughs> she understood, hold on, I'm still in the family. I'm still in the family. In my mind, I'm still wondering, where's Jesus going with this? And I'm so glad we have a Savior that can see. He knows the beginning from the end. And he was taking a liberty to use this as an example to those around him, much like he did with Job. <laughs> you know, Job didn't do anything to be tested, but God used his story. Job endured it. This woman endured what should have felt like persecution and ridicule. And she just stayed there. She's so witty and on point. It's like soon as it rang out that, oh, a family dog. Okay, so that means I'm in the house. I'm in the house of the Lord. Okay. And she replied, that's true, Lord. But even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath the master's table. <laughs> you know, when I heard that, I'm like, well, there, some people call it breadcrumbs in, in another version instead of scraps, the breadcrumbs. I'm wondering, I'm like, oh, the news of the Lord traveled the land fast. Because what do you think about when you hear breadcrumbs? I think about the feeding of the 5,000 as Jesus broke the bread and had crumbs, and he handed out crumbs, and it just kept on going, and it fed the multitude with leftovers. She heard the story. She knew who to go to. She's like, I can survive off of just the breadcrumbs. That's all I need. Sometimes we have stuff going on in our life that it gets so heavy that we're looking for this big miracle. And we miss the breadcrumbs. We miss the little things in life that God's trying to show us. God, Jesus is present all throughout our life, and we miss it so many times. 
so many times because we're looking for these big natural signs and wonders coming. And when God's just trying to work on us and give us a little bit at a time, but it will sustain us. Jesus goes on to tell her, dear woman, <laughs> your faith is great and your quest is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. That's the, there's only two people in the Bible that Jesus compliments their faith. Now, see, he displayed this out in front of his disciples. He knew where this was going to go before he started in with this woman. He knew what this woman was there for. He knew her limits. Let's understand that. This doesn't give you permission to go out and call people dogs because they're not of your, you know, belief system and, you know, your lifestyle and your culture. <laughs> um, much like Jesus flipping the tables in the church, I think that sometimes there's righteous things that we cannot touch and we shouldn't try. But in this, there's two people. That's right. Sorry, I lost my place. It's ADHD. Forgive me, y'all. <laughs> but the centurion servant and then this woman. And these are people that weren't believers. They just heard about his authority. And so their faith was anchored in his authority that they knew all he had to do was say the word. All I got to do is just go to him, and he will do it. I'm pretty sure after this, he kind of just looked back at his disciples. I'd have loved to have been in the room. I'm like, oh, you of little faith. Why can't y'all be like her? Y'all telling her to go away, but y'all need to learn something from this woman. Also about that story, like I said, the woman went through a lot of persecution. What made her that desperate to sit there through that ridicule? I mean, you got to think about it. This woman was walking into a room filled with Jewish people, and she was a Gentile. She wasn't supposed to be there. She wasn't welcome there. Anybody ever had an awkward situation where you walk into a crowd that you know people don't like you? Maybe they're looking at you weird, and you're just wanting to hurry up, get in there, and get out. Take care of whatever business you got to take care of and get out. So what motivated this woman to come in there and make a scene even after the disciples were telling get out of here jesus ignoring her she was desperate you take a mom like she said her daughter was demon possessed and being tormented severely any mother any father you let something happen to that kid everything goes out the window everything and you want everything for that child to get better. So she knew the need was great. And so she would push through in order to go to the Savior. Go to Jesus that she heard all the stories for and say, please help. Please help. And Jesus ignored her. I got hung up on that for a minute. Because we all go through stuff. And I don't know what you're going through today. I know I'm going through stuff. And we can't always just let everybody know our personal business because you got to sometimes protect that so people don't change it up and it gets used against you and stuff. But we all have battles. We all have struggles. We're all facing things. And life gets difficult. How many times have we gone before the Lord? And we're asking for something, and we don't feel like we're getting heard. And he's just sitting there, and he's waiting. You're like, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? Do you even care? I've been in that season. But, you know, the difference was he ignored her until she came and got in a different position and changed her posture and got before him. And instead of just calling him son of David, she said, Lord, Savior, I need you. Please. Because you see, God's worried about what's going on in your life. It's not that what, what you're going through doesn't matter. But Jesus doesn't, we get so concerned about the things of this world and our experiences. Jesus, he's not like that. He cares. But he cares about what really matters. 
your soul. And so even though this woman was bringing something, a burden before him, it wasn't until she got down and she worshipped. Worship team, come up. Until she got down and acknowledged who he was, not there for what he could do, but got on her knees and acknowledged who he was. And just aside from all the ridicule, aside from all the hardship and the embarrassment, she just started worshiping. So I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what makes it hard for you to go out and share your testimony with others. But how's your heart? Church, we have to come back to a heart of worship in this place. You know, yes, we can look to the past. I do remember, I've been going to church here since I was a kid. And yeah, we've had those Pentecostal services with people laid out. And, you know, those are great. And we can wish upon the things of the past. But what are you doing while you're waiting for that to happen? Are you ushering that in? Are you praying for that to happen? Are you taking part? Because we can't just stand there and wait on everybody else to start the movement. We have to do our part. Yes, we wait upon the Lord. But what are you doing while you're waiting? What are you doing while you're waiting? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the word you have for us, Lord. Lord, you know what everybody in this congregation, what they're going through. I don't. But you do, and that's all that matters. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me for allowing my circumstances to control my worship. bring us back to a place of worship where it's just, it's all about you. Nothing else matters. Church, I can't imagine. Sometimes when we're going through something long enough and we're suffering, it gets hard to push on. My wife has been battling pain in her back and her body for two and a half years and I start to ask God why and I don't understand I know it's got to get hard for her our pastor's wife Shauna has experienced ailments in her body for a long time and it, it, it cripples her but you know what inspires me the most last Sunday when I see Shauna up here pouring out the Holy Spirit And through all of her pain and her sickness, she has the audacity and the confidence to just boldly say, it's not about me. It's about him. That's so inspiring because I can't imagine the desperation and the anxiety and the depression that goes on with trying to push on through something like that. I know it gets rough on my wife. But the days when I see her fighting the hardest, turning on worship music and just getting in his presence and crying out to God and still pouring into our family, that's so encouraging. There's just something about putting the troubles of this world aside and chasing the assignment that we're given. 1 Peter 5, verse 9 it talks about that we're going to suffer. But we must know that we're not the only one going through it. We're not alone. Our brothers and our sisters all across this world are suffering in the same manner. So we're not alone, church. We're not alone. But it also goes on to say that after we have suffered for a little while, while the God of all grace, all grace will lift us up. You know, as I thought about that, all grace, 
we look at grace being God delivering us from our circumstances and finally coming through. I want to focus on that word all. Because maybe for you, maybe for my wife and Shauna, that grace is just having the strength to get through the next day. And it's a day by day deal. And you often overlook, you're still looking for your miracle, but God's with you, sustaining you through whatever you're facing. That's still grace. You're still breathing. While you're waiting on your healing or your miracle, what are we doing while we're waiting? Lord, I just ask that you be with every single person here, Lord God. Give them strength in their struggle, Lord God. Give them peace in the middle of the trials. Holy Spirit, I ask you to just speak life to their situation they're facing, Lord, whatever it may be. Give them hope. Give them joy. But Lord, let them know all that's found at your feet and in your presence, Lord God create in us a clean heart, Lord God, and bring us back to a place of worship, Lord God, to where this church can live up to its name, Bethel, the house of the Lord. And when people come here, they'll know they're in the presence of the Lord and that the presence of the Lord lives within each and every single person in this church, Lord God, that they'll look around and not see perfect people, Lord God but see broken people that just depend on you to get through each day. Church, I just want to invite you. If you're facing anything different or if you're going through anything, you need to pray. These altars are open. If you need someone to pray with, somebody will be happy to pray with you. Me or one of the elder members of the church. But I just want to call y'all to just come back to a heart of worship. Really examine your life and really think what's been holding me back from sharing the good news? Lord, what do you want me to do while I'm waiting on you to come back? away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a worth that will bless your my 
plunged deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you it's all about you much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord, help us to carry this mindset, this moment, beyond this moment itself. Lord, as we sing that we want to come back, that we want to commit to it being all about you, we want to take our role as your church seriously. Lord, I pray that you would help us to Give us grace to carry that out, to live up to the challenge that we've, that you've given us this morning and the things that you've put on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to wrap up here in just a second. I want to give you a couple of announcements, and then we'll be dismissed. First of all, thank you, Kevin, for that word. Appreciate you stepping in when Pastor's not here. Guys, it's hard, and uh, you did a great job, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. Can you give him a round of applause? Sorry, I can't really clap. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Um, s- as far as announcements go, first of all, just want to let you know, in case you don't know, there are Connect cards in the back of the seat in front of you. If you take one of those and you fill it out, uh, give us whatever information you'd like us, th- us to have. We'd love to connect with you. Um, or you can write a prayer request on there. Either way, if you fill one of those cards out, you can drop it at uh, Guest Central on your way out, and we'll be praying for you. We'll get connected. Um and then uh, as far as what's coming up, next Sunday is BGMC Sunday. If you don't know what that is, just a brief explanation. Uh, we care about missions here at this church. World missions is, is the, the heart of God. And we are, um, we monthly, we have a service where the kids in the kids church focus on missions. And then they are encouraged throughout the month to collect money for missions. And that's when they give their offering 
two missions once a month on BGMC Sunday, and they collect money from us as we try to exit the uh, the <laughs> as we exit the sanctuary. So they'll be here. If you have any change that you've saved up over the over the month um, or anything that you want to donate to BGMC, the kids will be here to collect that next Sunday at the end of service. So bring your BGMC offerings. Um, other than that, as far as announcements go, uh, Back to Church Sunday is coming up. It's September 17th, getting closer and closer. We have invitations in the foyer, um, and we also have some posters that you can put up anywhere you're allowed to put up posters um, to encourage people to come to be here on, on September 17th. Um, anybody that you've been thinking about inviting, or uh, maybe you haven't been thinking about it, maybe God will place someone on your heart today. Uh, if especially if you feel like God's spoken it to you, you ought to be obedient. But uh, in general, right, we should be o inviting. This is exactly what Kevin was saying, right? We want to be busy while we wait for the Lord's return. And uh, and one of the ways we do that is by inviting people to church. And there's no uh, easier way than on a day when a lot of other people are going to be coming back. It'd be easy to, to, you know, no questions asked. Just come and have a good time at church. So that's Back to Church Sunday, September 17th. We're looking forward to that. Invite and also, of course, be praying for folks who, you might invite someone and they might say, yes, I'm going to be there. And then they haven't been in church in years. And that morning their car breaks down, that kind of stuff. That's th that's th we know that the enemy will, will be all over those kinds of things and trying to discourage people from being there. So let's do our part and pray as well. Another thing you can be praying for, like Tori prayed for earlier, is all the folks who are going back to school, especially um, the big group of kids that we just had go off to college or stay and go to college. Either way, right? Uh, well let's be praying for them. And our pastor will be back next Sunday, and looking forward to being here together again next Sunday. So why don't you guys stand up, and uh, if you can, and I'll pray a dismissal. I want to remind you uh, that you can give uh, in the uh, lock boxes that are in the foyer. Uh, those will be emptied out. They're locked, so you can safely drop stuff in there. They'll be emptied and uh, collected. Or you can give online at BethelBatonRouge.com, or you can text to give. And uh, that's just another way that we... Uh, contribute to the kingdom of God here while we wait for his return. And so I want to encourage you to do that and be obedient uh, to whatever God's calling you to do in terms of giving. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for just another day in your house. I'm so glad to be a part of this family of God. And uh, I just, I pray that uh, as we go this week that you would make real uh, the, the promises that we have uh, made in our hearts today, the things you've challenged us to, the things we've committed to, that you would help us to live that out, that you would convict us uh, as we go and, and maybe fall short, that you would help us to balance grace with the conviction to continue to uh, to be the people that you want us to be. And uh, and God, I just, uh, I pray that uh, as we go this week that you would just remind us that you're with us everywhere that we go and help us to uh, to, to, to be aware of that and to be listening for your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everybody.